Good afternoon. Thank you for being here today. Welcome to the University of South Carolina and to the inaugural Richard T. Greener Symposium. My name is Christian Anderson. We are so pleased to have you with here with, to have you here with us today. We are also pleased to have so many special guests with us. Of course, we have Representative James Clyburn with us, who you'll hear from in a little bit. Mayor Steve Benjamin is here, City of Columbia, and he has a. <laughs> And he has a special guest with him, the mayor of Los Angeles, uh, Eric Garcetti. Uh, you do know that you're in the Palmetto States USC, not the Golden States LA, USC. Okay, all right. Well, just as long as you know that you're, in, that you're at the right USC. Okay. Um, we're grateful to have the, many of the trustees here with us. Uh, Evelyn Bowsman is here with us, who is Richard T. Greener's granddaughter. We have uh, several Harvard alumni who are here from the South Carolina Alumni Club of, of Harvard. And of course, we have students, staff, faculty, and friends of the university. We're, all, we're grateful to have all of you here today, so thank you. Richard T. Greener served as professor from 1873 to 1877, and we are excited to welcome him back to campus. The question is, where does he belong here at today's university? Professor Greener taught philosophy, Latin, and Greek, so clearly he belongs in the College of Arts and Sciences. However, he also worked with the, he also worked with the legislature, lobbied the legislature for new scholarships for, uh, for students. Uh, and he realized that many of these students, most of them black, were not well prepared for university study because of the limited opportunities that they had had to that point. And so he created what was called a, what he called a sub-freshman class, a preparatory school. Well, in the College of Education, these are the questions that we, just, that we tackle. Issues of access and equity and college preparation. So maybe the College of Education. Of course, you would, would note, the law faculty would note, would rightly point out that Richard Greener attended and graduated from the law school while he was here, and later served as dean of the law school at Howard University, so that might be another home for him. And of course, Greener also served as the college librarian, organizing and cataloging the collection and making repairs to the Caroliniana Library. So, we have any number of places where he, he might live if you are here today. I think you get my point. Richard Greener was an intellectually curious man who does not fit neat categorization. It is fitting that his statue stands prominently next to the library, the intellectual hub of any university. I'm sure the deans of these four colleges, Lacey Ford of College of Arts and Sciences, uh, John Peterson of the College of Education, Rob Wilcox of Law, and Dean of Libraries, Tom McNally would each be happy to welcome Professor Greener to their faculty. And in a way, each of them have. These four colleges are the sponsors of today's symposium and we are so grateful for their support. So how did we get to this point of putting up a statue to Richard T. Greener at the University of South Carolina? It happened only because of the help of a great number of individuals. As I recount a bit of this story, you'll get a sense of a few of those people, but certainly not all of them. This is not an exhaustive list, and I know that we are anxious to get out and see the statue, so I won't spend all day naming everyone, but uh, certainly there were a lot of people who helped us along the way. So in the fall of 2010, Professor Catherine uh, Chaddock was teaching a course on the history of higher education. She mentioned Greener in class one day, and she also, uh, she mentioned that he was the first black professor at the desegregated campus during Reconstruction, and she mentioned that she had seen a plaque when she and I were at a conference on the history of education in Cambridge, noting that he was Harvard's first black graduate. Well, a student asked, why don't we have something here at the University of South Carolina? Why haven't I heard of him? Why don't I know about him? And well, do we actually have something here at USC? Well, the Black Alumni Council ha has a scholarship in his name, and there is a portrait in the president's office, and these are 
this is good, but these have a limited audience. So Professor Chaddock mentioned this to me and asked the same question that the students had raised. Shouldn't there be something to remember greener? She started a, a dialogue with these graduate students from her class in the Higher Education and Student Affairs Program, inclu in, including, and I will name them because they're the ones who got this started, Danny Bounds, Elizabeth Cantor, Stephen Harowitz, Michelle Ganio Henderson, Michael Jones, Dustin Struble, Aaron Sylvester, and Samantha Young-White. These informal conversations led to the idea to create an ad hoc committee to explore the possibilities of what could be done. Professor Lydia Brandt joined the art history faculty in the fall of 2011, and we invited her to be part of this uh, committee as well. This ad hoc committee was truly ad hoc. We had no special powers. We were not mandated by anyone or appointed. We just did it. People came and went as they were able, sometimes to lend expertise on a particular aspect of it. And of course, students uh, graduated and new ones joined in. There was a constant flow of voices. In February 2012, we held uh, in the Museum of Education and uh, the launch of an ideas competition, and this was Professor Brandt's idea, suggesting that we, while we as a committee had certain ideas of what we could do, we wanted to hear what the campus had to say. Uh, at the event, Mike and Elizabeth, two of the students spoke, as did Professor Bobby Donaldson. Uh, and when I opened the event, I looked into the crowd, and who was there? President and Mrs. Pastides, who have been ardent supporters of this process from the very beginning. There were a lot of ideas submitted, and both of the win both of the both winners from the st from among the student submissions, Sean Michael Glover and uh, Somerville Linthicium, suggested some form of sculpture, and both of them suggested that there be some kind of books involved in this piece because of Greener's love of learning. Professor Robert Wyneth con Wyneth's contribution on the faculty side suggested renaming the Thomas Cooper Library for as the Richard T. Greener Library. So. There are elements of all of these, uh, su of these uh, winning submissions as well as other submissions in, our f in the final design of the, of the sculpture and in the launching of this symposium. The committee then went on to, <clears throat> went about the work of finding a sculpture with a national search. And from a strong pool of finalists, John Hare's submission was selected in December of 2013. Dean McNally funded this maquette, uh, this model, that we were able to use as we went through the approval process with the Board of Trustees. Uh, Derek Gruner expertly guided us through this process and then once it was approved, Emily Jones, the landscape architect, uh, uh, designed the beautiful plaza and space that you will, that you will see around the, the statue. So university architect Derek uh, Gruner and Emily and all of those who worked with them, work with them, created a space that I'm sure you'll find inviting and beautiful. President Pastides, as I mentioned, has championed this all along and he worked with us with the board to help get the final approval. And we appreciate his support and the support of the Board of Trustees. So why do this? Why is this important? I think first of all we need to understand our history. The Reconstruction Era campus is, was, was up till recently not well known. It's still not well known by everyone. Immediately following the era in which the university was desegregated and the majority of students were black and we had a black professor and three black trustees, there were those who wanted to erase that history, who willfully erased that history. And there were those who benignly forgot that history. And then most of us simply didn't know that history, but now we do. Now we know more and we can do something about it. And we can use Greener, both his accomplishments here, but also what he represents to move forward, to learn about our history, but also in, in ways that we move forward. I think a second important reason is that representation matters. And I'll share with you one story that happened just this last Saturday when we were installing the statue. After he was in place, but we hadn't covered him up yet, uh, Emily and I were kind of looking on at what we, uh, at what we had done or what you know, the workers had done who did such a wonderful job of putting him in place. And three young African-American students walked up and one of the students happened to know a bit about Greener and started to tell the other students. 
And one of the students, her eyes just got bigger and bigger as she learned more and more about, about who Greener was. And then she looked at us and exclaimed, you put a statue of a black man right here, right here between the library and the Russell House where everyone will see it. And we've already heard some of this feedback about how representation uh, is important. All right, so when I teach my history, my course on the history of higher education, I tell my students to ask a question, a historical question, and then follow the data wherever it takes them. And once they have written the narrative of their story to then step back and ask themselves, what else, what if, what other possibilities could have happened? What if a certain person had taken a turn this way instead of that way, or an organization had made a decision this way or that way? It doesn't change the story, it doesn't change the narrative, but it helps you look at it through a new lens to just reconsider what could have happened and, and what, we, what we can do. You will next hear from Professor Catherine Chaddock, who has re recently published a biography of Richard Greener, and unfortunately we put it clear up here so a lot of you didn't see that it was for sale out here but it is available down in the bookstore and I will say that she is donating the, the profits of that book to the Greener Fund. Um, so in any case to repeat you will hear from Professor Chaddock who recently published this, this biography of Greener and after she speaks Professor of Theater Stan Brown will perform a selection from the play The White Problem as, as Greener based on one of his most famous essays. As you listen to more about his life, and as you listen to Greener in his own words, consider the possibilities of what might have been. Ask yourself the question, what if? Thanks all of you for coming and being here and supporting this effort in so many ways. Even people that just asked us once in a while, how's it going, were key to supporting this effort. When we began about eight years ago, I frankly knew very little about Greener. I knew about what you have on the back of your program tonight, you know, the, the firsts, the Harvard first, the USC first, the uh, diplomatic first, black person to be a diplomat in a white majority country, et cetera, et cetera. But, and the titles, the sort of the renown for being great orator, terrific writer, et cetera. But I, it turned out, didn't know a lot about Greener uh, by knowing those things. When I started researching for a biography about him, I, I realized that, wow, my job at the university has always been teaching research and writing, but it's really a job about learning. So I thought tonight, just very quickly, I think I timed it at five minutes, I'd tell you a few of the things I learned by doing that I thought were key, that became key to me about Greener. One of the first things I learned, and it was kind of interesting, was how he got to South Carolina. And, um, it, it's kind of an interesting story. After Harvard, he, which he graduated in 1870, he first taught school and then became a, an acting principal in Philadelphia, and then taught school and became a principal at an a, um, African-American high school in Washington, D.C. So about six or seven years after this teaching and so forth, he got a letter from the trustees of, of the University of South Carolina, newly integrated, saying, asking if he would maybe be interested in ever considering being a professor there. It turns out that one of the new trustees of the university knew Charles Sumner, the Massachusetts senator, who knew Greener and had said, hey, this would be kind of interesting. You're integrating, and you know, you should integrate the faculty too. So Greener gets this letter out of the blue. And he decides, well, I'll think about it for a couple of weeks. I'll just think about it for a couple of weeks. Nine days later, he gets another letter from the trustees. You have just been elected. <laughs> <laughs> Professor of Mental and Moral Philosophy. Those trustees worked very fast in those days. <laughs> they worked very fast. Uh, and so he decided he might as well do it. Uh, I did learn also that beyond the firsts and the titles and the accolades, um, 
he wasn't just standing out there as a somebody. He actually was an achiever. He actually worked very hard to make real achievements in equal justice, equal opportunity, civil rights, et cetera. Um, you'll hear later some of the things he did while he was here on campus, and, and we know a lot of things he did for students, which was wonderful. He also spoke all over the state and out of state for the cause of equal opportunity and civil rights. He also um, wrote for newspapers around this state and elsewhere. Usually it was newspapers. He didn't get into journal articles until later. They didn't require that for faculty. <laughs> that back then. Uh, he lobbied the state legislature, successfully usually, for, for more money for this campus. And he lobbied in Washington. He lobbied President Grant for, for a civil rights bill and so forth and so on. He campaigned relentlessly throughout this state in 1876 in the elections, mostly in the local elections at that time. That was the, um, um, the Hayes election nationally. He campaigned throughout the state wherever he could. And so he was not just a title. He was an achiever. And that was a learning for me, and a, a good learning. I was thankful. Oh my gosh, I'm doing a biography. I hope this guy really did some stuff. <laughs> At any rate, I also learned something about what his educational experiences meant. I mean, here he is, a graduate of Oberlin, Andover, and Harvard. But guess what? He didn't have the same opportunities that his fellow graduates of Harvard had. The white elite boys that were going into banking and medicine and law and so forth. I mean, he went to teach at a high school. That's as good as it got for him when he left Harvard. Um, he, he had to push. He had to really get determined. He had to be a little out there. Pe because of pushing, he did succeed and he did have achievements. But he, was all, he could also be seen as arrogant. He could be seen as a little bit too much to take. Um, he could even be seen sometimes as self-absorbed. And, but it t my conclusion was that it took some of that to get where he got and to achieve everything he achieved. So that was another learning for me. Uh, I learned that in his case particularly, but probably in a lot of cases, color really mattered. He was a light-skinned, black person. He was well known to be a black person. There's no doubt about it. But he was very light skinned. So he got some opportunities that maybe some others wouldn't have gotten. But he also got often three years into a job or whatever. Uh, hmm, he's too black for us whites. And then he would get he's too white for us blacks. It was a double whammy many times. The black newspapers were not his friend. Um, and, and so that was, that meant setbacks, that meant disappointments, but he also had, as, as we talk about more in the program, those great achievements. So, uh, you know, it, it, it was tough though. Skin color mattered. He had a family, a wife that he married while he was here at South Carolina. She was from Washington, D.C. Five children. Eventually, the five children and the wife did not go with him to Vladivostok, Russia. They stayed home in, in New York City at that time. They changed their name. They passed as white. They crossed the color line. And they got some tremendous opportunities, those kids. Teachers College at Columbia University, University of Tennessee, graduating with a master's in engineering in 1913. That was one of his sons. Um, just on and on. So, he never saw that family again when he came back from Vladivostok. He did have another family in Vladivostok with a wonderful Japanese woman whose granddaughter is here today, as, as Christian said. And when he left Vladivostok, when Teddy Roosevelt became president and wanted his own people in diplomatic posts and so forth, Greener, a little naively, thought he might get back someday. He never 
got back to that part of the world. Lucky for me, <laughs> lucky for me, he, he and his daughter by that union did write back and forth in the 19-teens and Mrs. Bousman, who's here today, saved those letters. And that is a treasure that has now been given as of today to this university and to our university archivist. <laughs> um, finally, I, did, I think I did learn a little bit um, I think others may know more, but I, I learned a little bit about why Greener really loved South Carolina and uh, considered himself later to be from South Carolina. Oh, it's my adopted state. When people would say, where are you from? South Carolina, my adopted state. He spent more time in Vladivostok, New York City, Massachusetts, Philadelphia in his life than he ever spent in his four years in South Carolina, uh, really just three and a half years. And yet, South Carolina was his adopted state. Well, he was here during Reconstruction, a time when this campus did a wonderful job, as Christian pointed out. We were well integrated. The student body, the faculty, the trustees, the state legislature, of course. And um, he never felt like he was being treated lesser of anything or differently, or being called out, or whatever. He felt good about what he could accomplish, how people interacted with him, and so forth. So it was a good time during Reconstruction. When Reconstruction ended, the university became racially segregated again. Here's what one new trustee in 1877 gloated about this, the end of the integrated campus. We can now create a white Southern institution that reflects our Southern notions of personal honor and truth. Well, for more than 50 years now, this campus has been doing better than that. And the memorial to Richard Greener gives us an opportunity to show a commitment to continuing to doing better and better. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, as per the program, my name is Stan Brown. I'm a professor in the Department of Theater and Dance. And uh, I'll be doing a reading from the play, The White Problem, written by playwright John Tuttle, who is with us today. John and I have been trying to meet for years. And of course, today would be the day that I'm reading your material that we would meet. <laughs> but no pressure. OK. All right. My, uh, my topic tonight is the academic life, which is the type of life I've attempted to lead. Now, while I was teaching, I, I was professor of metaphysics and moral philosophy, and in that capacity, I became acquainted with a theory from which I now take great comfort. Now, according to this theory, time runs Backward. Hmm? Now, Aristotle, and before him Heraclitus, articulated for us the notion of time we now hold for granted, that to moments in our past we are constantly adding to the present. This one, and now this, and so on, you see. But here was a suggestion that events ripple backward from, well, from one fixed conclusion. It, it reaffirms for us Augustine's notions that in the mind of God, all of time, all of nature is, is not only united, but predestined toward one single common end that, well, that reconciles us. It, it ascribes to the whole of our lives some purpose, some justification, and we can feel it, too. We can feel it coming sometimes, can't we? I mean, though we cannot name it. I mean, it, we can feel it drawing near. What? Oh, Augustine, 
circa 400 A.D., the greatest of the Latin fathers whose philosophies opposed the Manichaean heresy, the simplistic division of the universe into contending realms of good and evil. What? Oh, Heraclitus. Heraclitus. 500 B.C. maintained that all is flux, that strife and struggle are conditions naturally attendant to change. What is it he meant by that, do you suppose? About strife and struggle and change. Do you suppose he was predicting Plato, or for that matter, that Augustine was repeating him? Huh? Oh, you're a freshman. <laughs> well, in that change is the movement toward truth, and in that truth can mean the final equilibrium of elements of the perfection of a condition. Yeah? And, and, if so, by extension, that the same could also be true of time. Yeah. Now, if there is one heresy that academics tend to inculcate, it is to split the world in two. Oh, there is nothing, no theory, no discipline, no, no country, no people even, that cannot be polarized and polemicized. I mean, it is black or white, good or bad, true or false. It is a habit of mind, contrary to true understanding, but still, you're always, always made to choose. I mean, even we educators are guilty of it. We tend to divide our students according to two distinct species. One, constitutes those wretched malinerers who see the academy as the fittest place for loafing and squandering, who steer themselves only toward success in life, and whose only questions are, what is the point of this ridiculous conflict of ideas? What is, what is the usefulness of all this bickering? Ah. The other species of student, ah, provides the one measure of reward in teaching. Because God knows there's no money in it. <laughs> now, such students recognize the academy for what it can be, a sanctuary for conciliation of discordant ideas, and a place, yes, for dreaming. Oh. A university, said John Stuart Mill, is not a place of professional education. No, no, no. Its object is to make fit and capable human beings. And that, while I was teaching, became my goal. For that is what I consider a truly academic life. And like St. Augustine himself, I would conjoin and meld different ideas, and yes, people even, into one happy, harmonious whole. And for a while, you know, I, I saw it work. I mean, for a while, the University of South Carolina was one of the greatest successes of the Reconstruction. Over a hundred students, black and white, living and studying together in utter harmony, a, a microcosm of the perfect society I have made my lifelong dream. But then, General Wade Hampton was elected governor. He signed the diplomas and shook the hands of the first grateful black graduates of the university and then expelled all the others and closed it so it could be reorganized as all white. I wrote three letters to protest his decision, each one angrier than the last and was ignored. And so, as a matter of principle, I packed my office, I closed my door, and I walked away. For one brief moment, the university had been the best of all possible worlds, an educational and, and social utopia. Gone! Thank you.
Well, good afternoon. As student body president, I've had the honor of representing our current student body, a diverse and vibrant community of over 34,000 students strong. As our history reminds us, not every student body president could claim to represent a diverse or inclusive campus community. Today's unveiling of the Professor Richard Greener statue represents an important step forward for our university as we take a collective look back at the incredible life of Professor Greener. Beginning with the plaques erected earlier this year on the historic horseshoe and now in unveiling this statue, we are recommitting ourselves to the values that we hold near, to appreciating the strength in our diversity and celebrating the progress that has been made since Professor Greener walked these grounds. Following our keynote speaker, we'll hear from our president, Dr. Harris Pastides. I've had the pleasure of working with Dr. Pastides since taking office, and one of the first things I noticed upon walking into his office the first time was the portrait of Professor Greener. As students, we are blessed with a president who believes in sustained, thoughtful, and collective dialogue in addressing the issues that confront us. President Pastides has not only had an unwavering commitment to seeing this project come to fruition, but has shown a commitment to promoting diversity every single day on campus, even when it's his birthday. <laughs> now our speaker today really needs no introduction. Congressman Clyburn represents the best of South Carolina. Before becoming a human rights advocate and later South Carolina's first African American to serve in Congress since Reconstruction, Congressman Clyburn was active in the student civil rights movement and then as a high school history teacher. His story reflects many of the same struggles faced by Richard T. Greener, but in a different time, produced different results. Congressman Clyburn has made it his mission to right many of the past wrongs inflicted on people of color throughout our nation's history. One of those instances includes securing a posthumous commission for South Carolinian Johnson Whitaker, who was expelled as the only African-American cadet at West Point in 1881 on false charges due to his race. Richard Greener was on the legal team that successful, unsuccessfully defended Whitaker, who was one of his former students here at the University of South Carolina. 114 years later, Mr. Clyburn led the successful congressional effort to have President Clinton award Whitaker's military commission to his descendants in 1995. More than a century separates Richard T. Greener's and Congressman Jim Clyburn's service, but their motivations and missions in life are one and the same. As a public servant who has dedicated his career to improving the life of South Carolinians, I can think of no one better to commemorate this statue here today. It is my pleasure to introduce to you all our esteemed guest here, Representative James Clyburn of South Carolina's 6th Congressional District. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Pastides, today is his birthday. Thank you so much. Thanks for your friendship and thank you so much for inviting me. I'm assuming you did. Uh, at least that's what Hope Derek told me, uh, that the invitation is coming from you. Thank you so much for inviting me uh, to be here, to be a part of this effort uh, this afternoon. To all the other uh, distinguished members of the platform here, and uh, where's the mayor? Mayor Benjamin, Mayor Garcetti, thank you so much for being here. I, I wish I could say that Mayor Garcetti was here because of me. <laughs> I think he has other things on his mind, but thank you so much for being in South Carolina. I um have been going th through my head listening to uh, Ms. Haddock take all of my speech, <laughs> uh, trying to figure out exactly how to approach this today. And I kept thinking about a writing, one little passage written by a guy named George Santiano, who once wrote, if we fail to learn the lessons of our history, we are bound to repeat them. When one 
were studies, the history of this university uh, from its founding and from its recruitment of Richard Theodore Greener uh, to its faculty. Uh, when one takes into account that this university was the only Southern University to integrate itself. When one takes into account the fact that after one year, the Greeny was made librarian at this university, and the fact that when one were to enter uh, the library at this institution, the collections uh, were more broad than any school of its type. And when one were to look at its production, uh, Jackson Whitaker was, in fact, Richard Greener's student, who went on to become uh, the first uh, African American to graduate uh, from West Point. He wasn't the first to attend. Of course, the first one to attend was also from South Carolina. But when you look at all of that history and the fact that if you were to pack into Greener's life here in the state all of four years, you have to ask yourself, why is it that this man born in Philadelphia, spent most of his life, life educating himself in Ohio, uh, Massachusetts, working in Washington, D.C., New York. Only four of all of those years spent here in South Carolina. And of course, when he came back uh, in 1877, he really came back to uh, closed down all of his stuff and to pick up a little check for $1,500 that the state owed him, but that he never got. All of the professors that had been owed the back pay, they all got theirs, but one member of the legislature, before approving the bill, struck Richard Green his name from the list, and he never got his money. You've got to ask yourself, why is it that a person of color can spend all of his time, basically, say, for four years outside of South Carolina? Why is it that he always referred to himself as a South Carolinian? Now, most people who would have experienced a lot of what he did would have spent all of their lives in iron ever having heard of South Carolina. But every time he was asked, he called South Carolina home. Well, if you look at what this state did up to its election of Wade Hampton, how this state met its challenges, how this state overcame, you'll have to know that it was because of his experiences here in South Carolina. He was able to compare the experiences he had in that four-year stretch with the experiences he had everywhere else that he lived, and he found the experiences here in South Carolina to be much more wholesome. That's why. When I wrote my memoirs, I called it Blessed Experiences. It's basically because a professor once said to me uh, during my student days down at South Carolina State, 
The young man, he said to me, you will never be any more, nor can you be any less than what your experiences allow you to be. Richard Grainer. Rena was who he was because of the experiences that he had. One of those experiences had to do with his uh, uh, decision to uh, respond uh, to Johnson Whitaker when he asked to be represented uh, when he was accused of tying himself up, feet and hands, and blooding himself and mutilating himself. And he was expelled for having done that to himself. And so when uh, he sent to his former teacher and asked that he be represented legally, Greener did something kind of interesting. He recruited and obtained the services of Daniel Chamberlain to be the lead attorney. Now, Chamberlain had been governor of South Carolina, had been defeated by Wade Hampton, and had gone off to New York and had uh, really begun to drift a bit rightward in his thinking. And quite frankly, by the time he died, he had become an extreme right winger. But Greener, because of the relationships and because of the importance of what was taking place, and because he thought if they had any chance to be victorious, he got Chamberlain to be the lead attorney because of the experiences he had with him. He had campaigned all over South Carolina for Chamberlain against Wade Hampton. And of course, he had campaigned naturally for Brother V. Hayes, only to be disappointed by both. But he never ceased calling South Carolina home. Now, I could rest on the laurels of his experiences, but I want to go just a little bit beyond his experiences. Last week, I um, was asked to be one of the speakers at the 200th anniversary of the birth of Frederick Douglass. The House of Representatives had a program in the Emancipation Hall of the Capitol, and in preparation for that speech, thanks to Mrs. Haddock, I had uh, found out about the relationship that existed between Greener and Frederick Douglass. Uh, and everybody thought I was real smart <laughs> in, in that speech. Well, Greener went to Rochester. Many of you may recall Frederick Douglass who was escaped from slavery in 1838 and went to live in Rochester. And most of his life was spent between Washington, D.C. and Rochester, New York. Greener went to Rochester, New York, to sit down at the knees of Frederick Douglass. And he said something kind of interesting when he talked about the meeting he had with, with Frederick Douglass. He called him the grand man. He said that in sitting with Douglas, both the hero and the hero worshiper were in their elements. He was just a little bit brash, but that's what it took to get the experiences that he got. He was not the only one to Sit with Douglas. Many, uh, Douglas. Many of you may know that when Frederick Douglass sat down with Abraham Lincoln to talk about what needed to happen, really to allow former slaves to, serve, to fight for their own freedom, 
And Douglas sat down with Lincoln, and sitting next to uh, Douglas at that meeting was Robert Smalls from Beaufort, South Carolina. Now, he, the reason I bring this up is because there are two things that I want us to think about as I make my last, my closing statement here today. This was the only university in the South to integrate. Robert Smalls did not have a formal education. When Robert Smalls left that meeting with Lincoln and Douglas, he came back to South Carolina. Frederick Douglass never came South. Robert Smalls may have been much better off if he had stayed in Washington, D.C., he had become the Mecca for people of color. But he came back to South Carolina. He was a delegate to the 1868 Constitutional Convention. He introduced a resolution that was approved by that convention that gave the nations its first free public school system. South Carolina. It's kind of interesting. South Carolina. There's another little passage that keeps coming to mind, and I'll close with that. Alexis de Tocqueville came to this country as a young man trying to find the secret to America. He traveled the country looking for what he called a secret. He went into state legislatures, went into all of the places of government looking for the secret. And he wrote that it was not until he went into our places of worship that it finally came to him what the secret of this country was. And he wrote these words. America is successful because Americans are good. And if Americans ever cease to be good, America will cease to be successful. Thank you, Congressman Clyburn. You're a hero of our university, of the people of our state. You're a tireless and forceful advocate for the poor, the hungry, the needy. We thank you for being here today. I'm also glad you didn't refer to me by my friend Harris because you've told me many times when you call someone my friend, you're really not their friend. So I'm. <laughs> thank you, Ross Lordo, for your uh, leadership, your stewardship of the student body. Uh, but not for outing me on my birthday today. I'm sorry about that. Thank you, Professor Chaddock, for writing that brilliant biography. Where would we be today in our knowledge about Richard T. Greener with that beautiful biography? I commend it to everybody here, and it's not that long either. <laughs> Prof Thank you. Professor Brown, you brought Richard T. Greener alive today, which is frankly what I hope the statue will do for so many people. <laughs> Professor Anderson, you are the heart and soul, along with many others, you'll be the first to say, many others who brought this project and this day to life. Our trustees, Moody, Cofield, Westbrook, Hubbard, Secretary Heath, Provost Gable, you also supported this project. Uh, even though the funding was incomplete. You said, we've got to go forward with it. Let's get this project done. The timing is now. Thank you to all of you. 
Chairman Johnson, I.S. Levy Johnson, who chairs our Community Advisory Committee, J.T. McLawhorn, Mayor Gar Garcetti, what an honor to have you with us today from the great city of Los Angeles. And Mayor Benjamin, what a great mayor you are and former student body president of Carolina. I could go on and on. I feel like we're at a family event here, but let's thank everybody. La ladies and gentlemen, uh, in 2008, shortly after starting my new role as university president, I visited the McKissick Museum to choose a few paintings for my office and for the outer office. I saw a portrait there of an extraordinarily handsome African-American man, but he was wearing vestments of an earlier er era, well before 1963, and the painting was safely stored away, tucked away in the basement of the McKissick. I moved in close and read the inscription, Richard T. Greener, PhD, born 1844, died 1922, lawyer, scholar, diplomat, professor of philosophy and logic, 1873 to 1877, but I wondered where. <laughs> I said to myself, but our university was not desegregated until 19, uh, 1963, September 11th, 1963 to be exact. I had read that history, and I knew those heroes with the names of Anderson, Monteith, and Solomon, but I did not know the name Greener. I was then instructed by historians far better than me who said, no, not exactly. From 1873 to 1877, South Carolina College, as you now know, like I learned, was an integrated campus. In fact, a majority black campus from a student point of view. And that had commenced on the 7th of October, 1873, when South Carolina Secretary of State Henry E. Hain registered in the medical school as the university's first black student. Furthermore, I was told about the professor of Richard T. Greener, in which you are now uh, even better versed. I instantly asked permission to take this exquisite painting with me. They said, not right now. We have to. <laughs> it had been painted by a uh, well-known artist, uh, Larry Levy, and had been commissioned by the university years earlier. And for nearly a decade now, Richard T. Greener is the first face that greets me, my staff, and all visitors who enter the foyer area of the president's office. In that way, I have come to know him very well. I'm often asked by visitors, who, who is that? And I enjoy sharing his inspiring story with visitors, frankly, from around the world. I tell them that he was a trailblazer, a risk taker, a man of education, and as Catherine told us, self-confidence. I tell him, I tell them that he embodies what we still seek even today in new professors and in new students. So when faculty and students in the College of Education proposed to erect a statue in his honor, our administration and board of trustees endorsed it, frankly, immediately. And as I told you before, provided an unprecedented shortcut to allow the statue to go forward before it had been fully funded. Again, the right idea at the right time. And when the decision had to be made about where to erect the statue, I asked university architect Derek Gruner, where on the entire university landscape do the most students pass on a daily basis? It was a tie. One of them, right across from the, between the Wendy's restaurant and the Moore School of Business, <laughs> in the middle of Assembly Street. I thought that was a very bad place for the statue of Richard Greener. Greener. And the other place was directly on the path between the Russell House, our student union, and the TCL, the Thomas Cooper Library. And we, we looked at many 
even better sheltered places because there are some majestic trees and originally the statue was going to be placed uh, under one of the trees and we said together, let's move it closer to the path. I hope that all of our students and others, visitors, will learn more about greener like I did. It took me far too long. Perhaps they'll wonder what this 29-year-old Harvard graduate thought of South Carolina College in 1873? Did he marvel at the horseshoe gates like so many other young faculty have done? Was he inspired by the beautiful library designed by Robert Mills? Did he find his new home at Lieber House? He lived on campus at Lieber, a building that is in good repair even today. Did he find it welcoming and acceptable or was he consumed with different thoughts and feelings altogether? That's what I want us all to think about. We don't know the answer, of course. Was he nervous or insecure having made the long journey from up north to a place largely unknown? In a city complying with the New World Order under federal oversight. All of us gathered here together know that advancing race relations and social justice both in America, in our state, and frankly on our university require much more than building a statue. It requires the ongoing commitment of all of us to insist on and work for the dignity and rights of every person. Diversity and inclusion is not just a worthy cause, it is America's greatest strength and must always be the greatest strength of the University of South Carolina. We've come a long way since 1873 and even since 1963, yet our work is far from done, let me be the first to say. Our racial history continues to cast a long shadow, and that shadow sometimes threatens our sense of community and well-being. But just like when one hears a frightening noise in the middle of the night and can't feel comfortable or safe until they rise to investigate and reassure themselves that their home is secure, so must we rise up when we hear a sound, when we see a sign that disrupts our sense of security. We will rise up to check our surroundings and to assure ourselves that our purpose and our values are intact. Sometimes, even when no one is there, we must say, not on our campus. I hope that all of you have seen our other new historical installations, two new markers on the horseshoe, both receive Board of Trustee approval, and both accord belated recognition to the craftsmanship and the contributions of the enslaved persons who lived and labored at South Carolina College. And while you're at it, please visit the desegregation garden right behind the Osborne Building with the beautiful inscribed poem by our own professor, Nikki Finney. I think it's fair to say that few universities or even other organizations anywhere in America have done more to acknowledge the dark moments in their history so that the light of justice can shine bright. In closing, let me say that 600 miles from here in Professor Greener's birthplace, Philadelphia, I believe that the great Liberty Bell, our Liberty Bell is joyously ringing in his name at this very moment. And in this moment, let us hear the echoes in our hearts as we welcome him home. Thank you very, very much. Well, a very special thank you to everyone who has helped make this inaugural symposium a special event. I say inaugural because this is not intended to be a one-time event. The plan is that each year we will hold the Richard T. Greener Symposium here at the University of South Carolina. The topics and the format will vary from year to year. This year we examined who Greener was and what he meant and means to this university and community. In future years we can use his life and career, parts of his life and career as touchstones 
and take off from those topics to have events. As you can see, there is no shortage of topics to talk about as they relate to Richard T. Greener. And the format could take on a number of forms. It could be a lecture, a symposia, a, a series of workshops. It could involve faculty or students or visitors from other universities or something theatrical, perhaps. Who knows? But we hope to do this every year, and this is the inaugural uh, event. And even this year, there are two events that, that may be of interest. Um, on March 28th, there is an event about South Carolina's African American lawyers and their legal education, uh, which will be presented by at the School of Law on Wednesday, March 28th, with Professor Lewis Burke. And on April 10th, in the evening at 7.30 p.m., there will be a concert uh, called the Richard Greener Tribute Concert, celebrating the life and legacy of USC's first African-American professors, and it will be the world premiere of, of that music. So again, uh, we appreciate the many individuals who have contributed to this effort, and uh, especially the music that Dean Taylor Harding arranged for, for us to have from our students, Pamela Bowman and uh, Gina Mahan, and, and their team made today's event happen. We thank those who traveled from near and far to be here. Thank you to Professor Chaddock for helping us learn more about Greener's life, and I would recommend, again, uh, her excellent biography to anyone. Uh, and after you stop at the bookstore to purchase your copy of her, of her biography, you can stop by the library. And just inside the lobby, there is an exhibit about Richard Greener that will be on display through the end of the month. Professor Brown, thank you for letting us hear Richard Greener in his voice and how he might have, have talked to us. And Professor Tuttle for letting us use some of your play. Ross, thank you for representing the undergraduates here today. Don't you wonder what it might have been like to take a class from Professor Greener? Well, you can, if you go to the display, there's a, one of his Latin exams. You can take it. <laughs> I mentioned President Pastidi's support earlier, and I will never hesitate to repeat our appreciation for all he's done to bring this project to fruition. And Representative Clyburn, when we hold the Richard T. Greener Symposium each year, your name will forever be on the program listed as the inaugural keynote speaker. So thank you so much for being here today and for sharing your insights and your, and your story. I mentioned that a group of students from the Higher Education and Student Affairs Program played a role in getting this all started. We thought it would only be appropriate that they help finish it. So three of those students, Danny Bounds, Michael Jones, and Samantha Young-White, who are with us today, and have, and they have traveled from Memphis, Charlottesville, and here in Columbia to be here. We have asked that they be, that they accompany Representative Clyburn, President Pastides, and Professor Lydia Brandt in unveiling the statue. So we are so grateful that they could be here to, to help us do that today. Dr. Todd Shaw, Associate Professor of Political Science and African American Studies and Chair of the Political Science Department and an alumnus of Howard University, one of uh, the institutions where Greener taught, will give us some of his thoughts on Greener outside at the site of the, of the statue right before we uh, unveil it. And then but now, we will hear a final reflection from Chelsea Evans. She earned her bachelor's degree here at Carolina and is now a third year law student here at USC. She is the first African American selected as the editor in chief of the South Carolina Law Review. Once she has concluded with her reflection, you are all invited to join us outside at the statue next to the library to welcome Professor Greener back to the University of South Carolina. Ms. Evans.
One of Maya Angelou's favorite quotes was by the author James Baldwin, who once said, your crown has been bought and paid for. All you have to do is put it on your head. Maya Angelou loved this quote because she firmly believed that we have already been paid for by people who have never seen our faces and will never know our names. When Oprah Winfrey asked Maya Angelou how she felt upon receiving the 2010 Presidential Medal of Freedom, Maya Angelou responded by saying that she thought of all the people who came before her. She thought of all the various groups that arrived in this country facing extreme hardships but looking for freedom. The Africans that arrived in bondage, the Irish who fled the potato famine, the Asians who built this country's railroads, the Arabs, the Jews, and other immigrants who arrived looking for opportunity. In fact, she said she sobbed in gratitude, knowing that all those people had already paid for her. When the university asked me to speak at this event, I was immediately overcome by a range of feelings, including excitement, humility, and a little bit of nervousness at the thought of having to speak in front of so many people. But above all, I felt a deep feeling of reverence for the person that Richard T. Greener was and for the opportunity to share some of my reflections as we celebrate his life and legacy today. As I sat down to write these remarks and reflect on what Richard Greener and this event mean to me, I immediately thought of how grateful Maya Angelou was for the people who came before her and their role in enabling her success. This May, I will have the great pleasure of graduating from the University of South Carolina School of Law. To make this accomplishment that much more significant, I have the privilege of saying that I serve as the first black editor-in-chief of the South Carolina Law Review. In this role, I am tasked with leading 57 other law students and publishing four books of legal scholarship, and I oversee all aspects of our operations and publication process. Being elected to serve as editor-in-chief of any law review at any law school is one of the most notable accomplishments a law student can achieve. My election to editor-in-chief was an extremely humbling experience for me and though I am certainly no Maya Angelou, I can relate to her feeling of being overwhelmed by the thought of the people who made my accomplishments possible. I can never stand before you today and say that I did this on my own. I had a wonderful support system, including family, friends, teachers, and a whole lot of mentors. But I've also been able to follow in the footsteps of those who came before me. So, when I think about Richard T. Greener and his legacy, I think about how over 100 years ago, Professor Greener planted the seeds that eventually created a path for me and other students like me to attend and succeed at this university. In the words of James Baldwin, through Professor Greener's efforts, my crown was bought and paid for. I am forever grateful for the role he had in shaping my future long before I was born. I believe that it is not enough for us to simply recognize Professor Greener's accomplishments through our gathering here today. In order to truly honor his legacy, I believe that we must keep breaking barriers and creating better opportunities for those who do not have them and those that follow behind us. After all, Professor Greener dedicated his life to that exact purpose. To truly honor him, we must all do the same. We are all beneficiaries of Professor Greener's work. Because of him and so many others like him, our crowns have already been bought and paid for. Now is the time for us to embrace our crowns, stand on the shoulders of the many that came before us, and purchase the next generation's crowns through the work that we must all do. Thank you.